Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's much talk today regarding the role of an apostle in the church. Apostles have many functions. For example, they pioneer churches, appoint elders, maintain an ongoing relationship with those elders, have input into the local churches for which they are responsible, bring correction when necessary, equip the saints, etc. But the main function of an apostle is to lay the foundations of new churches. When they're satisfied that the churches are established on those foundations, they don't stay, but appoint elders and move on. The very meaning of the word apostle is one who is sent, not one who stays. So apostles lay foundations. Eventually, foundations, whether they are of churches or of people's lives, will be revealed. The storms of life reveal that even Christians and churches sometimes build on wrong foundations. What looked okay when the sun was shining proved hopelessly inadequate when a storm came along. Just as the foundations of a building are hidden from view and yet are revealed in times of great pressure, so it is with spiritual foundations. The foundations the apostles laid are the person and work of Jesus Christ. Dear friend, build on Him, and when the storm comes along, your house will still be standing. This is Set Free with Ken Legg. And thanks for joining us. This week we're looking at the subject of my church, my family. And it's filled here along with author and pastor Ken Legg. And I think it's an important point you just made there, Ken, about the role of an apostle, and that is to lay the foundations of our faith, which, as you say, is Jesus Christ and nothing else. Yeah, there are many other great ministries, like fivefold ministries we talk about, but they don't lay foundations the same way that apostles do. For example, evangelists don't lay foundations. Evangelists are reapers, not builders. Mm. Uh, they leave a pile of bricks, if you like, behind them. <laughs> so you, you deal with that. Did you hear that story, by the way? Did I tell that on one of our programs about the bear hunters I'm in not, Canada? Not sure that you did. No, they, they went up into the, you know, the mountains uh, bear hunting for a weekend, uh, and one guy was just excited to get up there. As soon as they arrived, he wanted to go out and find a bear, you know. So I said, no, come on, relax, have a cup of tea, um, unpack and get settled in. He said, no, I'm going. I'm, so he went off and tried to find a bear, and uh, uh, about a couple of hours later, you know, the other two guys hear this commotion outside, and they look out the window, and there's this man Run, their friend running towards them, and a bear is in pursuit. So they said, okay, well, when he gets to the, the cabin, we'll open the door, and as soon as he's in, we'll shut the door in case the bear comes in, you know. Mm. So he got to the cabin, but then he sidestepped, and the bear rushes in, and they close the door. And he shouts through the window, you look after that one, and I'll go and get you another one. <laughs> well, that's an evangelist, isn't it? You know, he brings them in, you look after them, I'll go and get you some more. You clean them up, you, you sort them out. I've heard the phrase that, you know, they blow in, they blow up, and they blow out, you know. <laughs> yeah. Is that the same? Well, Philip was an evangelist, you know. Now, now here's an interesting thing. Philip went to Samaria, this is his incredible revival. Uh, but when all these people came to Christ, what did he do? He sent for the apostles. Now, the Bible says that they prayed for them, and they, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And some people think, oh, the apostles had to come so that these could receive the Holy Spirit. Well, Phil, you know, many people can pray for others to receive the Holy Spirit. Mm. No, they came so that they could actually give foundations to these new converts. Yep. Okay, so the question some listeners might have is, how do I know if my church has those foundations? What do you say to that? Well, let's say this, every church has foundations, but um, whether they realize it or not, they have foundations. The question is, what are those foundations? What are we building on? And we discover what the foundations of a church are when we go to build. So, for example, you know, you, you might want to do some building, uh, spiritually, I mean, in a church, and then somebody says, oh, hang on, uh, we've got to have a vote on that. <laughs> mm. So you've discovered what the foundations are. The foundations are democracy. Or, or somebody might say, well, um, we've never done that. No, we can't do that. We've never done that. We're not going to start now. Well, then you discover that the foundations are actually tradition. Or somebody might say, well, no, the Constitution doesn't allow that. So the foundations of the church are, are, are the Constitution. Or somebody might say, oh, you can't do that, Mrs. So-and-so. She's been in this church for many years, and, and she wouldn't like that. So the foundations are sentiment, you know? Yeah. So the foundations actually set the shape or the boundaries or the limitation of the building, and, and, and people gather around foundations. Good foundations are, are so critical. I remember in the UK actually going to a church whose la- foundation was laid I think it was in the year 300. Mm. Church is still standing, beautiful grand building, rock solid, doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. Mm. So they're very important. But what do you mean about people gathering around foundations, people yeah. gathering around them? Well, I think people know that they need foundations for, for three reasons, Phil. First of all, 
because they want a sense of belonging. You know, the Bible says that we are living stones. Well, that's okay, but where do we fit in? You know, like I can just be a brick, <laughs> mm. a doorstep, a stop, you know, uh, is that what I am? Is that my purpose? No, I'm a living stone. I fit in somewhere. Where do I fit in? First of all, you've got to have foundations. Secondly, uh, of course, people want security. Now, you've just illustrated that point well. Uh, you know, here's a building that's still standing after, was it AD 300 or yeah, something? That's right. Why? Because it had good foundations. A building without foundations is going to collapse. But thirdly, people need a sense of destiny. You know, we've got a house down the road um, which um, uh, has only just been built. And, uh, you know, the, the land had been lying there for years. Then all of a sudden, you know, we drive past and we, we see foundations have been laid. Now, that, that gives promise that there's going to be a building there soon. Something Something's coming. going to be built there. And uh, uh, people really want that sense of, okay, future and destiny. Mm. Well, in the, in the Word, Paul said that the church will be built on the foundation of the apostles' And the prophets, what did he mean? Mm. Well, you remember he chose 12 for that purpose and uh, one dropped out and he was replaced. And, and, and they were commissioned by Jesus to lay the foundations of the church. Now, the, 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 the church foundations are not the apostles, but what they spoke about, and that was Christ himself. Paul says, no other foundation can anyone lay but that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So each of the 12 had a revelation of Jesus. You look at the Gospels and, and they gradually started to get it. It was slow, you know, for example, with, with Peter. Uh, you know, Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And he's the one that comes up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Peter, because flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Mm. And on this rock, that is the rock of that revelation of the deity of Christ, I'll build my church. But then he says, <laughs> you know, now the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem, be crucified. And Peter says, no way, you know, not over my dead body sort of thing. And, and Jesus rebukes him. He says, get behind me. So he did not have a revelation of the work of Christ. And that had to come later. And you see that with the, with the disciples, you know, they were getting it piece by piece. But he said, you know, I've got many things to say to you, but you can't take it yet. But when the Holy Spirit has come, he will reveal it to you. And then, of course, we know, you know, Jesus died and, and they didn't really understand the significance of the cross. But then Jesus rose again and there was that, that, that journey to Emmaus and he caught up with two of the disciples and began to interpret everything from the Old Testament about how he would die, he would rise again, and, and that this would provide the foundation for the church. And they got it. You know, they started to get it. And mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit did come. And then all of a sudden we, we see 3,000 people get saved. What do, what do they um, teach them? The Bible says the apostles' doctrine. So the things that Jesus taught to them for those three years, they finally got it, and then they taught that to others. Mm -hmm. What about Paul, though? He wrote more epistles than the others. Where does he fit into all of that? Yeah, well, of course, um, those other disciples were called to lay the foundation of the original church, and the original gospel was preached first to the, to the Jews. So all those 12 were to lay the foundation for the church at Jerusalem, which then those foundations were taught in other churches. Now, it's interesting. We talked about Matthias, who replaced Judas. I didn't mention him by name, but we mentioned the fact that Judas dropped out. He was replaced by Matthias. Well, later on, James dropped out. He was, he was martyred. Why wasn't he replaced? Well, if you see where he was martyred, it was in Acts chapter 12. So that era had been completed. That laid the foundation. Mm. Chapter 13 is the gospel to the Gentiles. And this is where Paul comes in. Jesus saved him miraculously, took him out to the desert, taught him the exact same things that he taught to the other 12. So three years he was being taught by Jesus, one-on-one, -on -one, as it were, and he was hearing the same teaching. Now, here's the incredible thing. He went out, he started preaching, and he'd never met the other disciples and, and, and sort of checked notes with them. And then they hear, there's this guy called Paul. He's gone off with Barnabas, and they're preaching over there. I wonder if they're preaching the right stuff. Then they meet up, and the Bible says they check notes, and there's Peter, there's John, there's James, and there's Paul. And they all check what they've been preaching, and it's the same gospel. It's really quite incredible when you think it through, but it's because they had that foundation of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's right. It was Jesus that taught the Twelve, and it was Jesus that taught Paul. And we can know, Phil, that the, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ has been the one true foundation for the church down through the ages. That's all we have time for today. Join us tomorrow as we continue our conversation on My Church, My Family. Until then, remember you don't have to carry that baggage. God wants you to be set free. For books, DVDs, small group studies and other resources from Ken Legg and details about Ken's ministry, shop online at vision.org.au. That's vision.org.au. 
Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 